So did you hear about the big news in science this week? Have you heard about this? Yeah? yeah? The idea that uh, scientists this week announced that they detected something called gravitational waves. And so you might ask, well, why is this a big deal? Well, gravitational waves were one of the last phenomena that were theoretically predicted by Einstein over 100 years ago uh, that had never yet been observed. And the reason they had not yet been observed is because we didn't have any instruments that were um, fine enough to be able to detect them. But by using these giant antennas that are over two and a half miles long, a few months ago, a team was able finally to see evidence of the collision of two black holes, okay, two black holes running into each other in space. One black hole was 36 times the mass of our sun. Another one was 20 t 29 times the mass of our sun. That's what they know about these two black holes when they went together. And they were able to detect this event using laser sensors that can pick up vibrations that are as fine as one ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton. So it's uh, like it's, I can't even really begin to imagine this, right? Um, but with this kind of precision, they were able to see something happening in the universe, even though it was a billion light years away. A billion light years. Now, to put this in perspective, a light year is just a little less than at six trillion miles. Six trillion. They saw something that took place six billion trillion miles away. I'm blown away by that. I mean, to imagine, first of all, that we could actually see something that's that far away. And then even, not even that, but to step back from it and say, there is something that's that far away, right? That's amazing. We worship God whom we say made all of this. All of it. Not just Earth, but a whole universe. Billions and billions of light years across. Containing perhaps, we have no idea, but perhaps 100 billion galaxies. Maybe more. So God is big. God is expansive. God is full of all kinds of possibilities. And that's why we're doing this series, is really to explore in more depth what can we find out about the nature of God. And the way that we're going to do that is by looking at some of the names that the scripture gives for God, and specifically the names that are given in the context of John's gospel, the, what we call the I am sayings. There's seven of them in John's gospel. And uh, we have that slide. Great, thank you. So uh, here are the sayings. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the true vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. So there are seven of these sayings in John's gospel. So then you might ask, well, then why is today's reading from Exodus? Okay, well, I can explain that too. Well, in Exodus 3, you have the story of the burning bush, right? And it's the first time in the Bible where God reveals God's own name. And God says, if you ask me my name, I will tell you I am. And obviously, I am fits into all of these sayings. That's how all of them begin, I am. So the divine name I am is an important theological concept. It's something that our Jewish brothers and sisters have considered to be very important through time. And I think it's one that we should spend some time with as well. So you might start by thinking about names in general. Don't ever let anyone tell you that a name is not important. That's why I try very hard to work on names all the time. Now, some of you know that I don't always get them right. Um, I had somebody correct me the other night. Um, I knew for months that I'd been kind of I, I was in the ballpark with this name, but I wasn't exactly right. And I knew I wasn't exactly right, but they would never correct me. So I never knew if I was wrong or not, right? So anyway, um, finally they said, wait, stop. This is the name, right? And that just happened the other night, after months. It's important to know names. Um, it's important to at least try. I remember the first time when I... Uh, walked into Zoe and Lily's school when we had first moved here. The principal there knew that we were coming. I didn't have to introduce myself or anything. 
you know, when Stephanie and I walked in, hello, Mr. and Mrs. Monaghan, it's good to meet you, right? I can't tell you how much that impressed me. I mean, and still now, you know, when I walk in, it's always, Mr. and Mrs. Monaghan, how are you? So names are a way that we establish a connection with people. It's a way that we establish rapport, right? It's one of the ways that we should, or it's one of the reasons why we should spend time thinking about God's name. Because when God says, to Moses, this is my name, I am is my name, then what God is saying on some level is, I want you to know me. You don't give somebody a name if you don't want them to know you, right? You never tell them your name if you don't want them to know you. So contrary to what a lot of people perceive or believe, God wants to be known by us. God wants us to call God's name. So there's another point here, too. Names are also important because at their best, they say something about us. They say something about who we are. So it was really important to me when my kids were born for those names to have a real personal meaning. That was important. You know, we'd suggest a name, and I'd look up the meaning of it. And I'd say, oh, my gosh, no way, right? It might be a pretty name, but when you look up what it actually means, you say, absolutely not. There's no way I'm doing that. And in Bible times, it was kind of taken as a truth that your name, whatever it was, good or bad, said something important about you. So the scriptures go out of their way to explain a lot of the names that show up. So, for example, we learn by reading the scripture that Jesus' name, what does it mean? It means God saves. It's a variant of the, word, of the name uh, Joshua, Yeshua, right? God saves. God saves. Or you might think about this one, Jesus' friend Lazarus, okay, whom Jesus raises from the dead. What does, what does his name mean? Well, it means God, he whom God helps. That's what it means, he whom God helps. Doesn't it make sense? Right? You see these names show up, and they have a meaning. They tell us something about what's about to happen. So I don't know if you've ever looked up the meaning of your name, uh, but it, you should. There have been a lot of times when I've thought about the meaning of my first name. So the meaning of my first name is God shall add. Okay. And there have been lots of times in my life when I've thought about that and said, and come back to that and held on to that as a blessing. Right? God shall add. Don't fear. God shall add. Right? So in ancient Israel, a name was a big thing. It was a very important thing. And so to give somebody a name also had... Um, some implications for the relationship in the sense that you always gave a name. It always went from the superior to the inferior was how the name was always given, right? So um, you see this in life today, too. Um, it's President's Day weekend. So it's sad that George W. Bush was huge on giving people around him nicknames. That was, his, that was one of his things. And supposedly it went back to his days at Yale. You can go on Wikipedia, which I did, which is pretty funny, actually. All the nicknames that he commonly used for people. Some of them are very, very clever. Some of them are kind of offensive. But some of them are really, really, really clever, actually. And I thought really funny. Um, but I'm guessing that no one, at least to his face, reciprocated that. That's what I'm guessing. I don't know, but I'm guessing that. In the Bible, we see this idea at work in Genesis 2.19 where God creates the animals and then brings them to the human to name them. So all the animals are brought before Adam, and Adam decides what they're all going to be called, right? So it's a sign that there is a hierarchy in the order of nature. And that's, that's what Genesis is trying to tell us there. But there's also power in a name. So when you think about it, to invoke the name of someone who is more powerful than you also is a way of tapping into their authority. So, for example, every time that we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. Well, we do that because we want to invoke his authority and his power over that prayer. The disciples, when they're sent out to cast out demons, they go out to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. But you can draw, again, on a closer-to-home example, right? If you have a project at work that really needs to get done, and you've got to work with maybe another department, maybe this is a special task that you've been given, and you've got to work uh, with another department, and they don't want to help you, what do you say, right? You go and you say, it's, listen, it's not me asking for this. 
It's Superintendent Smith who wants this, right? You have to go above to the boss, to the boss's boss's boss, right? Wherever you need to go in order to get that thing done. So there's an idea that invoking the name is also invoking the power that's behind that name. So again, use a presidential example. You know, you don't, I, I doubt that very many people in the White House call the president Barack on a common basis, right? It's, doesn't, it's not something that you do. It's Mr. President, right? My joke is whenever somebody gets elected bishop, they, they don't have a first name anymore. It's always, yes, bishop. Thank you, bishop. Appreciate it, bishop, right? They don't have a first name anymore. That's just what happens. That's a way of working with people and showing them respect. So Jews have always held that to call God by God's real name, to use the name that's, that's described here in this passage, is simply an improper thing, that we don't do it. In fact, the name which we would pronounce Yahweh, okay, that's the name, the I am name here in this passage of Scripture. It's simply not pronounced. In fact, in the Torah, if you pick up a Torah scroll, it's never even written out. It's written, only the consonants are written, none of the vowels. Okay? So when you see YHWH, those are the, that's the way that we would transcribe the letters into English. YHWH. That's the name Yahweh. But when it's read aloud in the synagogue, it's never pronounced. You always say Adonai. Adonai um, means Lord, right? So that's why when you're reading along in your Bible and you come to the place where Lord is in all capital letters, have you ever wondered about that? Why is it in small letters or capital letters? Whenever you see it in all caps, that's what's being indicated there, is that, hey, the translator is translating Yahweh, okay? And uh, actually, that Yahweh has a special name, Y-H-W-H. It's called the Tetragrammaton. Can you say that? <laughs> Tetragrammaton, uh, which always sounded like a fishing lure to me, honestly. <laughs> um, but in any case. So, uh, so Jews have been historically concerned about not giving offense to the point where, actually, you find in the New Testament scriptures, you find that during Jesus' trials... Nobody actually refers to God, right? When they're talking to Jesus, they say, are you the son of the Holy One? Are you the son of the Most High? Are you the son of the Blessed One, right? They'll use all of these other names and ways to talk around actually naming God. Because when you think about it, God wants to be known. But at the same time, when God says, my name is, I am who I am, there's also a distance there, isn't there? There's a little bit of a distance. There's this desire for God also to be respected. And there's a fear that we have of getting a little too close and too personal with God. So the name in itself sends us a clear message. Don't ever think that you've completely understood me. Don't ever think that I can't surprise you. Don't ever think that you've got me all figured out. I want you to know me. But remember, I will be who I will be. Do you remember where we started? We started with the idea that six billion trillion miles. And that's not even the whole way across the universe. A hundred billion galaxies maybe more. I will be who I will be. So we worship a God of possibility who can't and won't be defined by human language. We worship a God who transcends everything that we can say about God, who doesn't accept human limits. So this is the God that we see in Jesus. We see God both as human and divine. We see God as both dead and living. We see a God who wants to be known, but who refuses to be trapped in our expectations about who God should love, about whom God should bless, about 
whom God should be forgiving. Jesus surprised everyone. Not least the people who thought that they knew the most about God. So I want you to meditate on that this week. When you see people arguing about who God is, remember what it is that God says the name really is. I am. I will be who I will be. Not who you want me to be. I will be who I will be. God's capable of creating a universe trillions and trillions of miles wide. God's capable of walking on the earth in Jesus Christ. God's capable of creating seven billion people and loving every single one of them. God is I am. Nothing more, but also nothing less. Amen.